church. If you would tonight take your Bibles to find a place in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I just want to thank the Lord for His grace and His mercy for uh, everything He's doing in my life. Honestly, I can say that God is faithful. I'm really excited about the name. This has no conference and you know how real it is. Because I'm sure each and every one of us has been in a position in our life where we've got like, all over the small sin. I'm just looking back at everything that the Lord has done in my life. I'm very, very thankful. Never thought that I would actually be able to do some of the things that the Lord has allowed me to do. And that's completed my third semester ground. I'll uh, praise the Lord for that. And I was able to get through three point two. Something very, very scary for me. And I have two more that I want this to go. My God's grace next semester. I'll start my master's in education administration, so please, please pray for me. Uh, sometimes I feel like they're violating the grain of all this work they give you, but I'm just thankful for it. And tonight I can find a place in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, we begin to read in verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag, on the third day, that the Malachites had invaded the shop, and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives, that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burnt with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept, until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, the Hanum, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself, and the Lord is God. Tonight I like to, by God's great preaching message entitled, Taking the Power of Hope that is in God. Let us pray. The Father, tonight we thank you again for your grace and your mercy for this conference. So, Father, for the godly men that you've placed in uh, authority, the burden that you've given for young adults and adults alike, and Father, for teenagers and young people. And, uh, Father, just to show our country there, God, that there's hope in Christ. And, and Father, despite the circumstances and situations, Lord, we thank you for your grace. And I ask for your help. And I ask for your unction tonight. By your grace and by your spirit, Lord, help me as a preacher of word, preach thus say the Lord, and I pray that you bless our efforts here tonight. That so that thing that, that feels like giving up their God, I pray you can just encourage them and that they find the power of hope that is in Jesus Christ. And I ask you bless our night today. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, I pray. Amen. And just got a, a context here uh, in the Bible, uh, turn with me to the 15th chapter of the same book, 1 Samuel 15, and just to get a context of everything that's happening here. Uh, just to get an understanding of the background. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, it says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee, to anoint thee king over his, over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the, of the words of the Lord. Thus say the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Emelech did to Israel, having laid wait for him the way when he came out of Egypt. Now go and smite Emelech utterly me destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep. Verse 7 through 9, it says, And Saul smote a Malachite from Hibia, until the thou comes down to Shur, that which was over Egypt. Verse 9 says, And he took Agag, the king of the Malachites. And we see that Saul, he, he spared the king of the Malachites, when God clearly told him to exterminate, to remove these people from the land. Now, this is not genocide like how some people would go into foreign countries and uh, just take over people's land and kill them for no reason. But the Bible tells us throughout the scripture, these were exceedingly sinful people. You think of Jonah when he, the reason why some people believe that Jonah did not want to preach to the Ninevites was because they, 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 they were the very people that oppressed his people. Some historians believe that the Ninevites, they had the ability to take a man and cut him out of navel and fillet him while he's alive and just peel the skin off the body. And God said, Look, these people, they're, they're very wicked people. Go to remove them from the land, they're Malachites. 
As we move on in chapter 27 of 1 Samuel, we read again. It's there here in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 5 and 8. It says, And David said unto, the, unto Ashash, If I now find grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then they shall give him Ziklai that day. Wherefore Ziklai pertained unto the kings of Judah unto this day. At that time David dwelt in the country of the Philistines with a full year and four months. And David and his men went up and invaded Geshesh, Gishrites, and the Gezerites, and the Malachites. And it says here, For those nations were of all the habitations of the land, as thou goest to Shur, even unto the land of Egypt. And when we come back to 1 Samuel chapter 30, it says there, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Malachites had invaded to the south in Ziklag, and spit in Ziklag, and burned. And understand this, folks, we're living in Ziklag, we're living in a place with the Malachites. As long as we live, as long as we dwell in Ziklag, we're going to face situations in our life. We will experience uh, hopeless situations. And then the first thing that we hear, we see here is a hopeless situation. And understand this, the Ziklag Mountains, from all times, from all times, this is where they dwell. And as long as you're in this tabernacle, this fleshly body, as long as you're in this, this earth filled with sin, filled with hurt, you're going to suffer some things. And I remember one preacher, he just came up with a book entitled Your Best Life Now. That book has nothing, nowhere in that book it mentions the blood of Jesus Christ. How could you have your blessed life now without the Lord Jesus Christ in life? And this is a very famous preacher. And so many people, they're clinging on to that quote, you see them taking their selves to be in the clubs, my best life now. Lord God? Really? My best life now. But the blood of Jesus Christ nowhere to be mentioned. Understand this church, we're living in Ziklag. And as you look around our country, uh, I just keep up with everything that's happening on uh, Facebook and the news media and all that stuff. And it almost as if now it's turning down Afghanistan and all that stuff. These young boys shooting and, I mean, just innocent kids being killed by straight bullets. And the Bible says here, we, we find a hopeless situation. It says, and David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son and every man for his daughter. And here we, see, we find the, the, the mental and the psychological effect of a hopeless situation. When I say mental, it, it has to do with our emotions, how we feel when we're going through certain things, like the devil would come and tell us, you know what, the pastor don't know what you're going through. Why go to church? Right. Those Christians, they, they don't care about you. Why go to church? And the Bible said, they spoke of stoning David, the man of God, the man that, that, that fought for them, the man who went to battle for them. And it's so common that in our churches, when we're going through our situations, when we're going through things that we're going through, the first person we believe is the man of God. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Why do you want to preach more time and give him one white head time? He didn't know what that BDL term like electricity off. <laughs> Just calling me from the cabinet. And we turn out, we turn the Bible says every man is distressed for his son and for his daughter. And that's why we stress is common to every person. It doesn't matter how much they smile, how much they sing. Where is it by? We turn out politicians and we find that A's, A, B's, B, 1, 2, 3, that's it. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's the things that's going on in our country. Every man is so distressed. And I remember one preacher, he said, well, the man of God, we ought to pray for our pastors, honestly. The man of God suffers with the people, for the people, and by the people. And if you don't believe that, get close to your pastor. They face so much. Right. And I remember 2015, after the child would sell the preachers, and we were listening, we are driving back to our rooms, and brother, the preacher was preaching, and he mentioned how 27 preachers in the year before committed suicide. You hear about churches closing. You hear about people just giving up in the ministry. And there might be people here right now just wanting to throw in the towel. The emotional impact of a hopeless situation, the psychological impact of a hopeless situation, for the psychological, that goes without thought process. God don't love you. The pastor don't care about you. And you heard you heard of Trell last time, his co-worker, well, the Trell was sent by just stop giving the tithes and offering. Mm -hmm. That's the situation. Cut God short and not take care of things. 
Bible says here in Lamentation 20 says, How good the city sits solitary. That was full of people. How is it she become a widow? She that was great among the nation and the princess of Mount Province. How is she become tributary? How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones that were cut of the pure gold are on the top of the streets. The princes of the sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold. How are they esteemed as earthen pictures? And when you look at it, you group, how, how, how did the youth group become so small when this youth group was so filled with young people? Where, where are the young adults that should be in this conference right now? Mm -hmm. I mean, just look around. And we can think of others that should be in church right now that's not here. And I, and I, I like to talk to people who are no longer in church. I say, look at this. Compare the quality of your life now in contrast to the quality of life that you had when you were in church. We were serving God. Yeah. You know, when Jesus asked his disciples, will you also go away? And Peter said, to whom shall I go without the words of living life, living water? And I remember going to the UT, I'm part of the UT ministry. We go to the University of Tennessee and just preach the gospel. And I, was, I met one young man who's very arrogant in his attitude. And I said, tell me this. Can you define life without God? Then I said, okay, stop with this. Can you define morality without God? If God doesn't exist, then it means morality is subjective. It means we decide what is right and what is wrong. But, but instantly, we know that it doesn't matter where you go. You can go to Africa, you can go to the third world countries. They know that to, to rape someone, to kill someone, to steal, they know it's wrong. Even though they, have, they don't have a Bible, they don't have a law. We know what is right, we know it's wrong. We have a moral instinct, we are moral creatures. So therefore, if God doesn't exist, no one, there is no God that told us what is right and what is wrong. We're the ones that came up with it. So I said, tell me this. Those people in history that you look to watching, where did they get their morality from? He said, well, people in history, they read books and they looked at the ancient cities and kingdoms, and they found out how to construct morality. And I said, where did they get it from? He said, well, they look back in books and uh, they learn how to construct morality. And I said, where did they get it from? Where did they get it from? And he said, well, I said, yeah, you believe, you believe in evolution. A single cell organism evolved into a living being that evolved into an ape that lived in a cave. So I said, at some point, those cavemen that evolved from a single cell organism constructed morality. Therefore, we define what is right and what is wrong. So if I want to steal, break, and kill, who are to say that I'm wrong? Was I there when those evolved apes came together in Congress and decided what is right? But I didn't agree with all of that. So can you define morality without God? And there's a young lady standing right next to me. She said, what? As a as a, she's talking to that young man, she said, well, as an anthropology major, you're making me very upset right now. <laughs> and he didn't give an answer. And if we can't even define morality without God, how can we define the purpose of life without God? Right, right. The Bible says all things were created by him and for him. Right. So, so when we leave church, when we, when we blame the man of God and the people of God for our situation, right. when we go to right. hardship, right. to whom shall we go? Without having words in terms, that's what we meant. Where would we go? Where will I find the definition of life? When you, oh God Almighty, you have the words of eternal life. You possess eternal life. And in our distress, where are we going? Honestly, is there anything better than this? You know, some said, I would rather be a dog keeper. That's right. In the house of God, in the dwelling place. I'd rather be a dog keeper. I'd rather be the man that cleaned the bush around the church. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in the living classroom. <laughs> And honestly, that's my, I was that man that came to church and I'll stay and do it. Yeah. And you see uh, a hopeless situation, we see the psychological, psychological effects, the mental effects, and all of that. As we go on, how do we take, or how do we find the power of hope that should be gone? Chapter 6, 1 Samuel chapter 30. It says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stone in him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and every man for his daughter. But David encouraged himself, and the Lord is God. See, we, we, we tend to focus on the cause of our problem, but we don't, we don't focus on the, the God of our problems. It's easy to look at all our situations and all that stuff. The Bible says in the, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 8, it says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou doest not inquire wisely concerning this thing. 
So the sign so Solomon said, don't, don't, don't inquire. Don't say, why were the former days better than these days? As if the God of those days is not the same God of these days. And he said, when you do not, you do not inquire wisely. You charge God foolishly. And that's what Job actually meant when he said, thou charge God foolishly. You just make us a foolish man. Don't look at the cause of your problem. Don't look at the cause of your situation. Look at the God of your situation. Right. And what, how, how do you do that? The Bible said, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And one of my teachers, Mr. Magdalene, he mentioned how David, when, when I heard Lord, Lord God, he, was, he spoke of God as being open. He spoke of God as his personal God. It showed great emotion. He got personal, not just God my creator, but God who loves me, God who saves me, my salvation, my rock, my strength, my personal God. Take everything that you know about God and find your hope in that very, very God that loves you, that knows you. And David, if you look at back, I, I think he probably looked back at the days when he slipped a lion. He looked back at the day when he killed that bear and that lion. His God is Lord. So when we have the right view of God, we'll have the right view of our situation. Right. So it took, so he, he, we begin by taking a power of hope that is in God, by looking at the God of our situations, and not the cause of our situations. And as we go on here, the second thing I'd like to look at, verses 7 through 8, it says here, And David said unto Abathar, the priest, Ishmaelite's son, I pray to bring hither the ephod. And that was our brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after the truth? Shall I overthink them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overthink them, and without fail recover all. The second principle here is that we ought to empower our spiritual life. The first thing David said, I will recognize who God is. Bible said he went to the priest. I'm saying, while, uh, while all this stuff was going, the reason why he developed in sick life was to get away from Saul that was trying to kill him. So he went to the enemy of Saul and asked him for a piece of land and give him land and give him sick life. And the Bible said his seed is so just he dwelt in sick life. Now Saul is trying to persecute him, trying to kill him. So there is a way from the tabernacle. The, the Hebrew people, the Jews, they went to the tabernacle to pray. But he's far away from the tabernacle, dwelt in sick life. But he had a priest there. And he went to the priest. He went to the man of God. He said, give me that ephod. And if you read early on in the Old Testament, that, that ephod was a garment that the priest would wear with 12 stones on it, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And when those priests, when they wore it, they wore the 12 tribes of Israel on their breasts. They wore the, the, the tribes of Israel on their heart. Everything that happened in Israel, they wore it on their chest. They, they remembered Israel as a minister to God. So David, he went to the priest, he said, Give me that ephod. He sought God in prayer. So David, before he even engaged in the battle, he empowered his spiritual life. I remember one of my teachers again, he said, well, we fight our battles in private so we wouldn't have to fight our wars in public. You see, we, we, we ought to empower our spiritual lives. And I, I, believe, I believe this honestly. Our physical victories is preceded by a, a spiritual victory. Understand God told him, he said, yes, you will recover everything that the Bible has to you. And ask any successful lawyer. A court case isn't won in a courtroom. It's won in a private jail. When a lawyer is going through his, his documents, when the lawyer is going through the case, when he's processing each and every bit of information before he enters that courtroom, before he debates with all the lawyers, before he stands before a judge, his victory is already won in his private jail. And before David went to war, before we can actually engage in anything, we ought to empower our prayer life. The Bible tells us here in the book of Job, Job chapter 5, it says here, I will seek unto God. Unto God will I commit my cause, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth waters upon the fields. To set up on high those that be low, and those which mourn may be exalted to safety. The Job said, no, even though I'm going through my situations right now, I'm going to empower my spiritual life. The first thing we see David did, he recognized who God was, he empowered his spiritual life. 
Along with that, as we, as we go on in 2 Samuel, 1st Samuel, I'm sorry, 1st Samuel 30, this here is here in verse 9 and 10, it says, So David went, he and 600 men that were with him. So David went, he and 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Bayshaw, which were where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 men abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bayshaw. And we've got to remember those that cannot fight for themselves. Church, understand this. The Bible says here that David had 600 men. But if he went to pursue the Philistines, he only went to 400 men. So two out of 600 men had to stay behind. Because the Bible said they were so sore that they could not even go with the brook. They had no strength to fight. And we have people in our churches that are hurting so much. Like Pastor would often say, when we get to that point in our life, you are the tired and not at the end of the rope and just hold on. And we have some people in our lives in our churches that's, that's where they are in their lives right now. We ought to remember those that cannot fight for, the, for themselves, and we ought to fight for themselves. When we see the devil around, a church member trying to get a church member, a young person, a young adult, we ought to, we ought to bind ourselves around right, that right, man. We ought to bind ourselves around that Christian and fight for them. Yeah. And I also believe, I mean, I mean, some people, they just can't wait to tell church over, shout out, they can give you the six. This person is going to the child and give you the steep. They just can't wait to get on that person. They just can't wait to devour that person. But they should be praying for that person. Right, also, I believe this. Right. If we can pray as much as we gossip, we see the Shekinah glory. Yes. 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 I mean, what is the purpose of tearing down another Christian? That's the devil's job. You look at the right. 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 God wants to do a work, but we're, we're so fixed on the wrong things. That's right. We're, entert we're entertaining ourselves with all the wrong teams. Yeah. Oh, the Bible says this in the book of James. James chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. It says, Therewith bless be God, even the Father, and therewith curse be men, and which are made in a similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. When we see them, oh, hey, brother, I pray for you, I pray for you. Behind your backs. We know what they're going through. Child, you see me there? He ain't gonna win I just gotta take the bus. I'm gonna bring it in the sun hall. I gotta take my run out of the bus. Anyway. <laughs> we just can't wait to get on someone with this trust. No, see, I believe mean, I mean, it's time to build up each other. It's, it's time to edify each other. It's time to minister to each other. Because right, if we can't get in the house of God, where will we get it from? That's the purpose of the church. It's for God's people. It's where wounded and where things come for healing and comfort. That's what we ought to do for each other. God said, these things ought not to be. So Jesus said, no, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. That's the only way. If the, the, the outside world will look at what's going on in the church, and say, I, I want it. I can get out of the job. <laughs> I get out to my my good neighbor. The house of God should be a refuge for the people of God. Right. right. And so we see David, he fought for those who could not fight for themselves. The Bible said they were so weary that they could not even cross the road. They could not even have fighting they were fighting. And these were soldiers, not some weak men. And I like history. And you can study warfare in the old days. When the soldiers took an arrow in the leg, you would have to fight three days. The head of our own this day. We didn't want to use the bathroom during wartime. Hey, you had to stand right there. Give the fight. You read the book of Nehemiah, they were building with their instruments and with their tools in one hand and the spare the sword in the next hand. These were, these were rugged men. And so we see here, uh, we ought to fight when, I mean, even fight for our pastors sometimes. I mean, all kinds of people are persecuting the church right now. I would honestly. I think there's also a little bit of I would rather, I would much rather be persecuted by a man like the boss. I was sitting down in a tent meeting in Bristol. I look at a tent. It held about 2,000 people. When I look at I said, wow. This is the kind of work that Paul did. My neighbors, they would attend business and we would put up, put up tents for them. 
Sometimes I'd be up at like five in the morning, putting up a 10 spot of dog law and stuff, the 20 by 20s and 30 by 30s. And I had to roll it up, I had to fold it and roll it up and lift those big tents. And I mean, that, that would build me some muscle. I'd be carrying poles and that's the kind of stuff that would also fall in. That's the kind of mind that persecuted the church. But right now in the States, you have to sign the bylaws before you can become a church member. Because what happened, what happens, this is not what happens. Church member comes, like the old days, <clears throat> church member comes and says, no possible, it would be a privilege if you marry me and my wife. Now these days, you have these homosexual guys, they would come to church and say, I demand you to marry me and my man. Honestly. And now you have them. These, these are the kind of minds that are persecuting the church. No man and I call it for you have these cupcake fellows persecuting the church. Honestly. And, and I remember when the, the plasma screen TV came out and all that stuff, and uh, when the preacher would preach against the plasma screen TV, we'd have church members okay, we gotta fix this preacher now. Tell me what, we we raise up nothing in no life. Let's just buy him a plasma screen TV. And he can't preach against it. Let's just buy it. See, see, we can buy a favorite man, but we cannot buy a favorite God. Okay. Right. So you have these cupcake fellows who come to church, you know what? Let's give the preacher some money to solve them up to. When the man of God, when the man of God preach against us, and what? Oh, I wish it was something else. Hey? I didn't give him all kind of money to preach on me like that. <laughs> <laughs> and the devil used these cupcake fellows to persecute the church. You see, understand? The Bible says the Malachites, they took their sons and their daughters captive. That's, what happened. That's where so many of us are right now. We're in bondage, we're in captivity. Each and every, we know someone that was in church, that was faithful to church, but where are they now? They're in captivity. They stole all that thing. They stole their precious sons, their daughters. They took their sports. And some of you right now, you might have had some dream that, you know, you wanted to start a business. I mean, the devil just took that from you. You can't do that. You don't have, you don't have the resources for that. Mind of God, you want to do a great work for God. You can't do that. The church isn't big enough. You don't need fishing for that kind of stuff. Discouraged Christians, they want to get on their knees and pray. You can't do that. You go into this house, you worship what? You're sitting right here. The Malachites, who are they? Pitch of the flesh. <coughs> read this, I read the Bible, and so many people, they're, they're, they're in captivity right now. And it's possible to be sitting in church and you're still in captivity. Your mind is held in captivity. You want to worship God so much. You want to give all to God. You want to surrender to the Lord, but the best thing is you can't do that. You're struggling financially right now. You can't. You can't go to church this morning. You're struggling right now. That preacher, he don't care about you. All these pastors do it. They ride down in their nice cars and wear suits. Like that. That's all they do. So the Bible says we ought to fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. And as we go on, Verses 11 through 16 of 1 Samuel 30. It says here, And they found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him to drink water, and they gave him a piece of cake of figs, and two platters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water, three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to the Malachites. And my master left me because three days gone I fell sick. He made an invasion upon the south of the Chariots, and upon the coast which belonged to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and burned Ziklag with fire. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt not kill me, nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken of the land of the Philistines and all of the land of Judah. And David smote them. Here, you ought to recognize the leading of the Lord. See, you understand this? God placed this young Egyptian right in the path of David. I don't think it was coincidence. The Bible said, three days he felt sick. He doesn't mention how he got sick, why he was sick. But you know what it is? The answer is, he left him. And so this young man traveling, probably in the wilderness, without food, without water, sick for three days. Somehow, we're a divine appointment. My God, 
came in the path we did, and we ought to recognize the need. The Bible says, God, when, when we're in our temptation, we will always make a way of escape. I mean, the Bible says this, the book of Psalm, it says, if I had faith, I had faith it unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's like this. It's a, it's a zombie. It's like this. All I can see is the bad things that's happening right now. It's like the devil took the, the dust of the earth and threw it in my eyes. And all I can see is the distress and everything I'm going through. And I can't see any of the blessings of God. But the psalm said, I have faith it unless I had believed to see the goodness of God. It's, it's easy to come out of bruises, but it's time to come out of blessings. And see this, David, he reckoned, he learned how to recognize the leading of the Lord. The Lord put this young Egyptian man right in his pathway. Who was he? He was serving of the Malachites. This very Malachites that burned the line and took their wives, their sons, and their daughters. And David said, Didn't take him to this man. The Egyptian said, Just promise me with this one. Don't deliver him to me, don't kill me. There's some food and some grapes. That's what he did. It. <laughs> But honestly, we ought, we ought to recognize God always gives us a solution to our problems. Don't just sit there and soak things out. God is making a way a provision for us. Yeah. We ought to learn how to recognize yeah. the leading, the divine leading, the divine appointments that God puts in our life. <clears throat> Those things. Verse 17 says this. And David saw them from twilight, even to the evening, to the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. We are the fight. We recognize who God is. We empower our spiritual lives. We look for the lead of the Lord. Now it's time to fight. It's time to do practical things. That's time to church. There are you imagine you have a hurting brother or sister, like Jesus gave his power. They walk at midnight asking for bread. And you say, well, I, I can pray for you. You have a whole boat in the cabinet. Now it's time to do the practical thing. And so many times where we just pray, pray, why is that faith for the is dead? And so many times God wants us to be so practical in our life, but all we see, I mean, some people say we're so we have to be minded about we're doing good. But just can you imagine? You went to a doctor, Dr. Hillsburg. Dr. Hillsburg, I have a situation. I believe I have a heart problem. Oh, you have a heart problem? I'm a Christian. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Next, next question. Doc, I have this situation. I think my leg needs to be cleaned from all the infection and all that stuff. Or it's going to be amputated. What? Well, you have an infection? No, I'll, I'll pray for you. It's time to get practical. So many times we miss out so much on God's, God's blessings because it's not practical. I believe, I honestly believe that God will bless our efforts. That when God told the children of Israel, to go and possess the land. You know what they did? They tarried. They got scared. They considered all the giants in the land. And God said, you know what? Because you didn't obey right away, I will bless you. They had already prayed. God made all the provisions. They had to, they came out of Egypt as slaves. But they left Egypt. They had their spares and their swords. God provided all this stuff. God provided them with gold. He provided them with food. He provided them with everything that they needed for worship. And God said, now it's time to be practical. It's time to take up your sword and fight. We have to start fighting for our brothers and sisters. That person you don't see in church anymore. It's time to be practical. Get the car, drive to the house. Because now there's only 21 by 7. I know where you live. You know where I live. Knock on the door. You know what I mean? Just talk. You don't have to, you don't have to beat the Bible across the head. Just encourage someone. Honestly, people just looking for something. Sometimes people are just looking for encouragement. I had a friend while well, uh, I was about young man, two kids. He said a lot sometimes, I need encouragement. Then he just broke down in his breath. And I prayed and I prayed. Sometimes we need to fight. I mean, the things you do not fight for are the things that you lose. You know what happens in England right now? They are debating the public intellectuals. They are debating whether or not they should legislate religion right now. Those people, they're not fighting for that religious freedom. The boss in England, they had all the mission. There, the, the churches are now turning to mosque. And so many people, we're not fighting. We're not doing the practical things. Yes, we, we sit and pray and pray and pray. But it's time to fight, honestly. That person that is hurting, it's time to go and see that hurting person. It's time to counsel that hurting person. That, that, that's the way to fight. Counsel him with the person. It doesn't have to be formal. If he's sitting down having a meal with them, it's time to teach young people. 
honestly. So, we don't teach them about life. Someone else will teach them about life. I think the testament by Rashad, he thought I was life. Going and partying, having sex, and all this stuff. We fight through teaching them. These young girls, if, if, if you don't fight for them, if you don't teach them about sex, someone else will. I remember sitting down, uh, Link was talking about how this boss driver, how to violate these young school girls just for lunch money. And I just hear stories about how adults like their parents, women in Nassau, Bahamas, giving their, giving their daughters to these men just to pay the rent at the end of the month. Why is it not so bad? Who's fighting? They have no one fight for them. It's time to get back. I remember one of them when I was trying to so beat the wall. The first night I met him at work, he's telling me all this stuff. He's been doing this girl. And this and I'm just listening. The next night I shared it also. I mean, I had a rip. I was buying a rip snow. And then the next day, same thing. Honestly, Nasa, if, if you have three or four girlfriends, honestly, you like Nasa or something, that's the lesson in now. <laughs> and then a few days later, um, ring, 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 my phone rings as it were, and fix it, cleaning the tents like it normally do. Uh, well, you come here with me? Oh, oh, God, you come down. He went, yes, there. So run, 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 and guess what? Lo and behold, he said, man, I, when I was peeing, something happened. I have all this pain and all that stuff. The nurse tell me no way to see people. The girl, she, she, she already noticed. I called up because the nurse told me to call up. And she didn't answer my phone. Number. I was trying to fight for it. But you let this you let out. So you have to fight for this. Now that young man has to live for the rest of his life in a physical situation. And if we don't fight for the movement, it's time to fight for our church members. It's time to, to bind ourselves around that burden of money. And I remember uh, Dr. Gary Samuels, he gave an illustration of a body of snake. Like just how you saw in the book of First Samuel, when the people they were so distressed that they spoke of stone and David. You know what happened? They had a rattlesnake syndrome. Rattlesnake is this. When you pawn a rattlesnake, it, it knows its ability. It knows the kind of bad it has. It probably killed so many creatures before. But when you put a rattlesnake in the arm, it gets so stressed, so vexed, so upset that it bites itself and releases its own venom in its body and kills itself. That's how the stress a rattlesnake is. And so because we're so bitter inside, so many hurt, they're so bitter inside that they poison themselves. And that's what it is, but it's just poison. And it's time to fight for that person. It's time to fight church. Not only that, but as we read on in verse 20, it says here, And David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drove before those cattle, and said, This is David's fault. And David came to 200 men, to the 200 men. These are 200 men that were so weak that they could not fight. The Bible says, And David came to the 200 men, which were so weak that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Bashor. And they went forth to meet David, and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came there to the people, he saluted them. David said, no, even though you couldn't fight, you're still my soldiers. You're still, I know, I know, because I know what you're able to do. I know. See, church, when we have a sweet, loving church member, and all of a sudden we see them with a pile at you, they're very irritated. Some, something's wrong. So David said, you know what, even though you couldn't fight, I recognize you. You're my soldier. David, the Bible said he saluted them. As we read on, it says, then answered all the wicked men and the men of Belial. This word Belial, it means no good or good for nothing. The Bible says, it referred to the sons of Eli as men of Belial right? because they slept with the women at the tabernacle, at the entrance of the tabernacle. So the Bible says here, then answered all the wicked men, the men of Belial, those that went to David, and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man and his wife and his children, and they that lend to them away and departed. Then David said, Ye shall not do so, my brethren. But that which the Lord had given us, who had preserved us, and delivered the company that came against us into their hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? 
and his and as he did his part and that go it down to the battle so they were said not out of the city these were our brother even though they could fight they did some lose point principle is this we are the best of this when god bless us and it seems to go right for us hey we need to like chop said naomi she went to a far country where they had a farm for 10 years Now she had property of course she did have leave for your own she did there was principle in those days because that man had to work it was a farming so when someone was plucking up the wheat each and every day for 10 years someone was planting seeds someone was trying to water that land someone was trying to cultivate that barren land for 10 years and about that at, at the harvest they came back so when all food was ripe that's when they came back after 10 years now she comes in not only that she comes in with this whole bunch Like Jeff said, you look at like I'll I'll call them racial groups. Like, honestly, after 10 years, they came out good, but they had no foul spirit towards them. They welcomed them. So when God blessed us, we are the blessed ones. Don't hold on to the good things. There's a verse that I found in the book of Job. It was a great encouragement to me. Along with this, the same thing here. Job chapter 42 verse 10, it says this, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job in his grace distress. The Bible says Job, the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he, what, when he prayed for his friends. So many people, they will always and forever remain in captivity because of their selfishness. Mm. It was only until Job prayed for his friend that the Lord had turned his captivity. So many people, they think because they, they, their, the level of their distress isn't so enormous, they believe it's all wealthy. But the most unhappy people you ever find are these selfish people. They're content with few, one of you, it's me, my four, and no more. It's just all about me, I'll just get as much as I can get. But the Bible said, the Lord turns Job in captivity, and he prayed for his friends. And if you want to cherish her, do something for someone else. I mean, I, I met people here, I met people from Philippines and Haiti. I mean, they'll just go above and beyond for someone else. And they're some of the most obvious people who will have to be. They're from some of the most poorest families, from the most poorest countries. But the fact that they do for others, they're the most freest person in their life. Yes, Jesus Christ, you give that great box, says, life does not consist of how much a man has. You won't find happiness and freedom in how much you have, but you'll find happiness and freedom of how much of God has, how much of your heart God has. Amen. That's where we find contentment. I mean, the more we have, it seems like the, the less content we are. The more we have, the less content we are. But we are to empower our care lives. We are to empower our spiritual lives. Every physical victory is preceded by spiritual victory. We are to fight for those who cannot fight for themselves, that's our church members, that's our lost family members, I mean, we are the, I mean, this is the actual laws we use now. The Bible tells us when David spot those men, it says 200 men fled. Guess what they were? Amalekites. God told Saul to kill Amalekites. He saved King Agag with Amalekites. Later on, we find more Amalekites in his life. David destroyed them, but 200 escaped. Guess what those men probably did? Rent some country and reproduce the world. The principle is this, the model I used to catch the laws of the law. Because there are laws in the law, there are laws in the law, there are laws in the law, there are laws in the law. There are laws in the law, there are laws in the law, there are laws in the law. So when Solomon said, don't say, why are these, why are the former days better than these days? Because understand this, the God of those good days is the same God that we have right now. So that's not very good. God is not laughing at his right. life for his power. And we've got all seen one of the great things in our life. But we ought to take the power of hope that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. And for that lost person right now, you're still in captivity, you're still in bondage. As long as you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you do not have that freedom which is in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Again, Peter said, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You possess the words of eternal life. And that first that first way of escaping captivity that the lost person in the other night is by receiving Jesus Christ as Son of God. As That person that wants to give up right now, that, that's going to a situation that you might, I mean, we have private things that are pretty bad, our closest ally in the middle. Sometimes, you know, 
before we go through those brief passages, all the cases in bondage shot of death, but we want to cling to God, continue to cling to Him. I also believe that God does His greatest work in our places. Wow. There was a short difference from William Cooper that I wrote here concerning the ground. It says here, restraining the crowd, we, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian now on the right. And, sem- and Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint on his knees. And I honestly believe, if we could pray as much as we do everything else, and defend ourselves, and also about us, tear down some else, we would see God do great things in our lives. I believe God wants to bless us more than he's blessing us now. I believe God wants to show us how great and mighty because why the Malachites, the Bible says when that young Egyptian man took David to those Amalekites, guess what they were doing? They were dancing, having a great time, having a feeling. We overcome the Israelites, we overcome David who overcame Goliath. We beat the best of the best. I mean, the world cannot champion because they, they, they are beating the house of God, the church of the living God. I believe God wants to do great things in our lives, but we are the we are the find the power for the presence of Lord Jesus Christ. That's great. Father, thank you, thank you for your grace and the power of the word.